Well, hello everyone, and welcome to the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum. I'm Valerie Neal. I have a frog in my throat today, but I work here as a space historian and curator. And we are in the Moving Beyond Earth Exhibition Gallery, which is where we tell the story of space flight in the period of the Space Shuttle and the International Space Station. You can see we have a large model of each uh, behind us here on stage. Um, I would like to welcome our audience, our live audience here in the Exhibition Gallery. We have two classes of students from Oyster Bilingual School and also from Whittier Space, um, Whittier e Education Campus. I'm trying to make them into a space school. Um, we would like to also welcome our online audience and our NASA television audience to this program today. And I'd like to offer a very big thanks to the Boeing Company, which makes this program possible once a month. Uh, I'd like to give you a quick briefing on our format today. We're going to have a little something of everything, um, and I think you'll find it very interesting. We're going to do some conversation. We're going to do some video, some stand-up talking, and we're also going to have a couple of sessions of questions and answers from our present audience and our online viewers. So be thinking of what you might want to ask our guest speaker, whom I would like to introduce now, if you will join me. Um, our program today is called From Cowboy Boots to Space Boots, and our guest is astronaut John D. Danny Olivas. Do you mind if I call you Danny? That's fine, thank you. <laughs> uh, I'd like to tell you four quick things about uh, astronaut Danny Olivas. Uh, in addition to being an astronaut, he is a mechanical engineer with a PhD which means that he does research and he could teach at the university level. He's also an inventor. He has several patents. He is a businessman running his own company now. He is an author. He's written one book and a number of scientific papers. And he's a husband and a dad. Not yet a granddad, right? Not yet a granddad. <laughs> So that's one thing about him personally. Uh, the second thing is he flew into space twice in 2007 and 2009 on space shuttle missions to the International Space Station. And he flew his second mission on our space shuttle, Discovery, which is on display at the Udvarahazi Center near Dulles Airport. So we always love to have a Discovery astronaut with us. Uh, the third thing is that he stayed in space on his two missions a total of almost a month. He was in space for 28 days, and he was a spacewalking astronaut. He got to go outside five times and work the equivalent of a full week outside the space station. Uh, that is totally cool. Um, and then finally, the fourth thing um, that I wanted to say is that Danny Olivas is one of 12 astronauts in the shuttle program with Hispanic heritage. And uh, welcome, Danny. We're delighted to have you here. Valerie, gracias. Me llamo Daniel Olivas, y yo nació aquí en los Estados Unidos, pero toda mi familia venía de México. My name is Danny Olivas. I was uh, born here in the United States, actually born in North Hollywood, California. And, uh, but my family is, in, is from, from Mexico, so I'm a Mexican-American descent. Well, thank you for being with us today. And why don't we sit down and have a chat? Sounds great. I thought we might start out by uh, just getting a little bit of sense of who you are. What were you like when you were about the age of the students here in the audience? What were, what were you doing? What were you interested in? What was your family like? Well, so I, I, I grew up in El Paso, Texas, even though I was born in North Hollywood. So I, I consider myself to be a, a Texan, kind of at heart. And um, I'd say that you know my, my growing up was actually very similar to, to a lot of the experiences that, that you have, and especially here in the museum. Um, when I was a kid growing up, my parents exposed us to, to a lot of different types of things, including uh, visits to museums and, and just a, a lot of interactive type of uh, exposures. And it was, uh, for me, during that time, actually when I was seven years old about, uh, that we went on a family vacation to the Johnson Space Center and got an opportunity to see the Space Center and, and, and see all of what NASA was doing during the Apollo era. 
that, that inspired me at that point that that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be involved in space and space flight. Well, did your family encourage you and your teachers? Uh, was there anybody in particular who was inspirational to you? Oh, absolutely. I think everyone, you know, certainly at that age, you want to inspire your, your children to, to study things like science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Um, for me, the exposure that I had with my father, because my father uh, was very much a shade tree type of mechanic who loved to work with his hands and fix things and work on things, and he, nothing really ever scared him mechanically. And he always brought me along with him whenever he was working on things, and I, I learned to come to appreciate the... Um, uh, the, the beauty of machines, and that's how I became a mechanical engineer. But with regard to El Paso and, and West Texas, West Texas is, is very remote. It's high desert uh, up by the Franklin Mountains. And during that time, we lived kind of on the outskirts, the east side of El Paso, and uh, there wasn't a whole lot of light pollution. So you could look out um, at night and just see stars forever. And I remember as a kid um, taking a small telescope that my parents bought for me, and going up on top of the roof at night and looking at the West Texas skies and looking at all the beautiful stars and, and, and the moon, and just, it was just wonderful. So you're one of those who knew at an early age that an astronaut is what you wanted to be. Well, I don't think as a, as a child you really kind of have a full understanding of, of where you want to go in life, but I thought to myself, boy, it would be neat to be an astronaut, but of course I also you know, played football and did a bunch of other things, so I thought it'd be neat to be a lot of other things. I think as I got a little bit older, it started to kind of appreciate that, boy, you know what, an astronaut is something that I, you know, I could definitely aspire to, 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 to pursue in my life. I didn't know how, didn't know why, but I knew that, that it was something that, that, I, that I desired because I knew that if we could put men on the moon to be able to fly in space, that that, that must be awesome. So, um, were you like the smartest kid in the class or? <laughs> Well, let's see. I think my teachers never use the word smart by itself when they describe me. They usually refer to me as a smart aleck. Um, you know, I, I think I was very, very average, uh, very uh, generic in my, in my um, uh, academic career. I didn't really quite understand math. I know I, we took it, didn't really understand its application of it, but went ahead and powered through it. Um, my parents encouraged me, and, and I did, I'd say, you know, maybe average, a little bit above average in, in my schooling. But it really wasn't until I, I got into, into college and I learned about this thing called engineering that, for me, math really started to make sense because I could see the physical world around me, and now I no longer saw, you know, like, let's say, a, a rail right there. I could, I could describe that rail in terms of forces and vectors and, and moments, and, and now all the math that I had been taking all these years started to make sense, and it all had context behind it, and it was then that I realized that this, machine, you know, mechanized world that I grew up loving and was exposed to now had a real scientific and academic, you know, foundation and I could use that to, to improve myself. And you also developed a specialty in material science, didn't you? Can you share a little with us what material science is all about? Sure. Well, it, it, as we might think, that anytime you have something, it's made out of something else. And uh, I actually like to study, believe it or not, not so much building things, although I've done, I've done some inventions myself. I like to understand why things break and how things break. And typically when something mechanical breaks, it's usually made out of something. It's made out of a metal, a plastic, a ceramic, some sort of a, you know, polymer. And um, understanding those basic materials allows us to be able to, to get a, bit, a deeper understanding of the, of the reasons why these things that we build break apart. So for example, um, during my astronaut career, I had the opportunity to work on uh, the Spatial Columbia breakup that occurred. I uh, worked with a, a, a colleague of ours, Pam Melroy, mm -hmm. and um, it's through that kind of inter, um, interdisciplinary understanding of me mechanical engineering and material science that kind of helped me really define what I want to do in my life. Well, and engineering and math are both about problem solving, right? And that's a good skill to have. Absolutely. Uh, an excellent skill to have. Well, uh, let me ask you this. Did you ever struggle with any of your academics or your athletics or did everything, uh, did you ever fail at anything and have to kind of pick yourself up and start over? Yeah, absolutely. And, and what I'd say, one of the, the keys to, to my success was not so much kind of what I did, but the, the people that I had behind me. 
uh, from my, my parents when I was at a, at a very young age to even my wife, who's, who's here today, and my wife, uh, Marie, sitting over here, and I've got the, the three of my children, three of my five children are here as well in, in, the, in the gallery. Um, uh, it's, it's that encouragement and support to basically push beyond what you're comfortable with and push beyond your own failings and, and where you fall short. Uh, it's really easy for us to look introspectively and say, boy, you know what, that, that was really tough. It hurt for me to get a bad grade. I don't know that I can do it. I don't know that I want to do it. But by having the encouragement and support of, of, our, of our spouses and our, and our, and our parents, you know, we can accomplish a, a number of things. Well, uh, that sounds like a really interesting background, and I suspect there's some students here in the audience and, and also online who share some of those interests with you, and so maybe they will see in you uh, um, a suggestion of what may be in their future as well. Well, and I think a, an important part of that, Valerie, is that you know the, the, the uh, students and actually everybody, we all have to look internally to really decide what it is that, that, that we're passionate about. And when I go back to my days in West Texas, you know, in El Paso, looking up at the sky at night, I was always fascinated by space, and I still am today. And it was through my love of engineering that I found a path that would take me from a person who builds things to ultimately become uh, an astronaut on, on a space shuttle flight. But it's through that, that passion and taking my talents and skills and applying them in that area of, of passion that, you know, it's ultimately allowed me to pursue something that to be honest with you, when I was sitting in your seats, um, I don't know that I ever really thought it, was a, it could be a possibility, but through hard work and determination, you can accomplish anything. Now, you came into the Astronaut Corps in the um, late 1990s, and by then, there were already several Hispanic astronauts in the Corps. Uh, did those of you form uh, a little group, uh, kind of a self-identified group as Hispanic astronauts, or did you just meld into the total astronaut corps? Well, I think it's less. The, the astronaut corps is very much like an extended, um, kind of like a family, because everyone who's in the astronaut corps experiences a very unique um, set of, of experiences, and, and consequently, you tend to, to bond around those experiences. It's the same kind of training, the same kind of workload, the same kind of studying, uh, the same kind of, kind of you know, vehicles that, that, that you're flying, and so uh, all those tend to really bond everybody together. And one thing that the space shuttle program really did well was it brought in diversity. So no longer were we seeing astronauts for being a male, astronauts for being a female, astronauts for being African American or, or white or, or Hispanic, but really astronauts in general. And it's through that level of diversity and inclusion that the space shuttle program did a very effective job of demonstrating that we can be the best by having that, that inclusive nature and us basically all working together to solve some very difficult problems. So you all never spoke Spanish, just so the others wouldn't know what you were talking about. <laughs> uh, well, I notice you're wearing cowboy boots today, and you are, after all, a Texan. So I just have to ask, at some point in your life, did you want to be a cowboy, or did you admire cowboys? Or Well, so, so here's my take on being a cowboy. I mean, a, a cowboy is about, about exploring the frontier. It's about being out there on your own, having a level of, of self-resilience and, and, uh, and, and pushing yourself. Um, when I think about, about my experience in, in El Paso, I was surrounded by, by cowboys. You know, I, I learned to ride a horse. Um, I'm a hunter. I'm a fisher, fisherman. Uh, so I, I do a lot of outdoors things. I actually grew up loving the outdoors. And, and I told myself when I flew in space that you know, some astronauts, they decide they want to go out and buy a Corvette and drive around really fast because that's what the early astronauts did. That wasn't for me. I said, you know what I, I really would like to do when I, when I fly my first mission is when I come back, I'd like to get myself my own pair of, of flight boots, my own pair of boots that represent my flight. So these ones I'm wearing today actually are the ones that I had from STS-117, which were, um, I flew in 2007. That was aboard Atlantis. But since you were so kind to, to um, call me here today and, and, and provide me an opportunity to, to speak to the folks. Um, I have a gift I'd like to present to you and to the Smithsonian. Um, this is the set of boots that I had made after my flight on STS-128, which was Discovery. And um, oh, I'd like to uh, present this to you and to the Smithsonian. So you can see on the front, it's got the, um, 
the STS-128 logo. And I thought that uh, what better place for these to kind of spend the rest of their time with the, uh, the ship that inspired her, and that's Discovery here at Smithsonian. So I'd like to present oh, this to you. Thank the you. <laughs> Let's put those here. Now, Danny can touch these because these are his personal boots. But once they come into the collection here in the Smithsonian, we don't touch them with our own hands anymore. Um, we always wear gloves, either white gloves like this or um, latex gloves because we don't want to leave our fingerprints and oils and such on them. So uh, just to mark this transition today, I'm going to put these boots on and be the first curator to touch Danny's STS-128 boots. Thank you so much. We have a lot of space boots in the collection. We don't have cowboy boots, uh, so this will be a first. We have one pair in our collection, but we don't really know who they belong to. Um, so on that note, and this high point of uh, receiving this donation, why don't we see if there are some questions uh, from our audience? Do we have one online already? We have an invisible question online. That's technology for you, right? <laughs> technology is great when it works quickly. I think we'll start with someone here. <laughs> Can you what repeat happens, the question? What happens when you throw up without gravity? <clears throat> well, first off, let's make a real quick correction. Actually, in space, there is gravity, but we can talk about that a little bit later. But when you're in this weightless environment, so you're basically orbiting around the planet, and you throw up, what do you think would happen? This goes everywhere. <laughs> now, sounds kind of funny, sounds kind of gross, right? Because you wouldn't want to get that on your skin. But it's more than just that. It's also extremely hazardous because if you get that bile in your eye, it could cause severe pain. If you inhale it and it gets into your lungs, it could cause all sorts of respiratory problems. So throwing up in space is not, a, not an insignificant matter. And in fact, astronauts, when we go through training, you actually train on what to do if and when you do throw up, or if you see someone throwing up, they actually have these specially designed bags that have diapers around the side that allow you to, to, to throw up basically into the bag as much as you can, but then these diapers basically soak up any of the bile that's there because it is such a hazard of, in space. Bueno, en el colegio, en mi, mi, mi universidad, yo estudié in, uh, uh, in, de ingeniero de mecánico y también de materiales. What did you study uh, in your university? So I studied mechanical engineering and material science. So basically, how did I feel when blasted off and left the, left the atmosphere of the Earth? Uh, cuando, cuando sales del mundo, hace, el cohete hace mucho vibración. When you take off from Earth, the thing that you really experience most is the vibration. It's a very jarring vibration, so much so that if you're trying to read your computer screens, your eyes can't focus on, on what you're looking at. So the astronauts undergo a lot of training to make sure that they're ready for the time that they actually do launch in space, that they understand their procedures very, very well, because you're going to have all, you're going to be overwhelmed with all sorts of things that you never thought you'd be exposed to, things like vibration and the sound and, and really just the excitement of you. Your adrenaline's running really, really high. You're very excited. And, you know, you've you got to be ready to run those procedures because you want to make sure you get there safely. Like, how did it feel um, like, being in a spaceship? 
What did it feel like being in a spaceship? Well, when you first arrive on orbit, um, the thing about it in space, there's no up or down or left or right. There's only closer to things or further away from things. And the reason being is because the sensation of gravity, like right now as we sit here and we look around, we know where gravity is acting because we can see people sitting on the floor. They can sit on chairs. So you could ask anybody, which way is gravity acting? Because they can see with their eyeballs, it's pulling straight down, right? You can also feel it. You know, if you close your eyes, you can jump up and down. You know which way the gravity is pulling you. And also in your inner ear, you have these three little tubes that are filled with fluid. And those are your inner esta uh, station tubes. Those tubes help you get a sense of, of which way is up and which way is down. Well, the second you get into space, none of that works. Because you, if you're here in space, you can work on the floor, you can work on the ceiling, you can work on the walls, you can work right side up, upside down. And it's, it's very, very disorienting. So when you first get into space, one of the first things you have to do is really kind of come to appreciate that, okay, I'm in space now and I can really work in all three dimensions. I'm not limited to just working in one plane. Okay, is there a difference in, in time between space and, and Earth? Um, I'm just gonna say this one in English because it's a little hard to understand. When you're going around the planet, you're going around about 16 times a day. So in a 24 hour period, you'll see 16 sunrises and sunsets if you're up for the full 24 hours. So about once every 90 minutes, you're back to where you started. But of course, the Earth rotates underneath you. The Earth rotates at, you know, basically one full revolution every 24 hours. So in, in space, there is no relative time because we track time here on Earth based on the rising and setting of the sun. But if the, the, sun, the sun is rising and setting 16 times during a 24-hour period, it's hard to figure that out, especially if the people who are controlling you and helping you out are on the ground experiencing a 24-hour clock. So the reality is, is that you really don't know what time it is. You always have to check your watch. And we have, we have watches that, that give us time not only for Houston, but also for Greenwich Mean Time. We also have uh, the European time, because they're also tied very closely to the Russians. Plus, if you're getting ready to go do something, you keep track of your own time. So you have anywhere from, from five to six clocks um, on board at any one time. How long did it take you to leave Earth? Well, surprisingly, from the time that you leave the planet where you're going zero miles an hour to the time that you actually make it into orbit on the space shuttle took ex about eight and a half minutes. So you're going from zero miles an hour to basically 17,500 miles an hour. That's the fastest vehicle on the planet. You don't. <laughs> and the, well, that's a good question, but the reality is, is that if you try to spray water in space, just like your throw up or just like any liquid, it's gonna go anywhere, whichever direction it's moving at the time, it's gonna go that direction. And the water doesn't flow in space either, so if it like collected on the walls, it wouldn't flow down into a drain and just you know, get pulled out. So we don't spray water in space, but what we do is we basically take um, a little bottle of water with a, uh, a washcloth, spray some on the washcloth, put a little bit of soap on there, and basically take sponge baths. Because uh, if you tried to spray yourself with water, water would get everywhere. Are you really desperate to take a real shower when you come back to Earth? It's funny that you should ask that because <laughs> when we first arrived on SGS-117, a good buddy of mine, Sonny Williams, and I'm sure she's, she's been here, um, I think you get very paranoid because you're not, you're not taking a shower, you feel like you maybe smell. I know I felt like I maybe smelled because I just wasn't familiar with not taking a shower. And one of the very first questions she had out of her mouth when we opened up the hatch was she says, Danny, tell me, do I smell? <laughs> and, I said, and I said, no, you're just fine. And it works very well to keep, you know, to keep the body clean. For me, it was because it was what inspired me. So the question was, 
Um, if I grew up in Texas, why, why was I inspired to become an astronaut? Well, for me, it was really about looking up at the night sky. You know, when you look at the night sky, you're not really looking at today. You're looking at light that came from someplace else a long, long time ago. The closest star that we have to us, which is the sun, it takes 8 minutes and 20 seconds for that light to reach us. So even as we look up at, at, the, at, you know, at, at light coming from the sun, it originated eight and a half minutes ago. With every star that's out there and every galaxy that we can possibly see, all that represents not today, but represents some time in the past. So to me, that was very fascinating. And, and, and as I've gotten older and, I, and I've learned more about, about our universe, um, I get even, I have even more questions about it. And that's one thing I love so much about space. It's not about finding answers. It's about learning and asking more questions. Thank you all for your questions, and we will take some more questions in just a few minutes. Uh, but now, Danny brought a video to show us, and he's going to talk to us about his time in space. So, okay. Well, take it over, Danny. Thank you, Valerie. Okay, what I've got, uh, you'll see, I've got a video that's coming on right now that is some uh, video that I took during STS-128. Uh, this is on, on Discovery in 2009. So. I'm going to sit quiet, you guys can watch a video, and this is all captured from our, from our actual flights.
I know uh, some of the, 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 the questions that I get um, about space flight and space travel, um, some of them are technical and didn't really want to spend a whole lot of time talking about STS-128 or really any of the, the space shuttle missions. I thought what I'd do is I'd spend a few minutes talking today about what it's like to live and work in space. And I think probably the best characterization I can come up with is uh, just by show of hands, who's been on a camping trip? Or who's been on a really long car ride with their family? <laughs> or who's been cooped up in some place where you wish you could just kind of get out of, right? Okay, so we've all kind of been there, right? One of the biggest things that um, people don't necessarily think about when you're an astronaut is that living and working in space is exactly like that. Uh, when you're inside the space shuttle or the, in the space station, you could be there anywhere from during the space shuttle missions, anywhere from as short as, let's say, 8 to 16 days, to the space station, like uh, Mar uh, Scott Kelly just got back from spending a year in space. You may say, well, that's great. You know, I can look, at, look out the window and I can see all these, you know, I can see the earth, I can see all these, you know, the, the stars. It to be really, really cool. It's really, really cool, but then the next day, it's there again. And the day after that, and the day after that, and the day after that. So one of the things that NASA focuses on is trying to teach astronauts basically how to, to monitor themselves. In other words, how am I interacting with the people around me? You know, am I pacing myself appropriately? Well, we used to say during the space shuttle missions and the space station missions that when you did a space shuttle mission, it was like a sprint because you had 16 days to get things done as fast as you possibly could. The schedule was timed in about five minute increments. So down to about five minute increments, your whole day is planned from the time that you get up to the time that you go to bed. That's 16 hours. The space station, on the other hand, you're up there for six months at a time. So it's more of a marathon. You have to be able to pace yourself. And you can imagine during that time is that not only are you accomplishing technical tasks like doing spacewalks or doing robotic operations, but you're also having to do the things that you do on a daily basis here on Earth. That's everything from cleaning house to brushing your teeth, going to the bathroom, going to sleep. Now let me tell you a little bit about the, how some of those differ from here on Earth. Let's talk about sleep, for example. In space, it doesn't really matter where you are if you weren't ready to go to sleep. You don't have to have a bedroom. The fact of the matter is you don't even have to have a bed. What we have on the space shuttle and now is used on space station are sleep restraints. Now because the space station is a little bit bigger, they can actually have compartments that the crew members can stay in. But in the space shuttle era, you could sleep anywhere you wanted to. You could sleep on the floor, you could sleep on the ceiling, you could sleep upside down, right side up. It didn't really matter. They'd put you in this, you would get you this bag and you would, uh, basically it's like a sleeping bag but it doesn't have all the, the, the stuff in it. It has a couple holes cut out on the side. You pop in, actually you have to strap it to the wall or Velcro it up to the wall. Hop in, zip it up, and basically just go right to sleep. Now, sleeping in space is quite a bit different than it is sleeping here on Earth because your body's used to gravity pulling it down. You feel yourself when you're actually laying in bed. Some astronauts, when you close your eyes, you feel like you're falling forward. In fact, I had that same sensation. Uh, some astronauts, it's so bad that they have to actually take bungee cords and strap them down to a wall to make them feel like they're laying on something. Because otherwise, they constantly feel like they're falling, they can never get to sleep. Some astronauts, when they, uh, when they go to sleep, they have to have their head on a pillow, okay? Well, you can't lay your head on a pillow in space because if you put your head on a pillow, it's just gonna push the pillow away or your head's gonna get pushed away. But NASA came up with a really cool invention. Basically, it's a foam block with a giant piece of Velcro that they put on the back of the head, they strap it to the front, and just pushes your head against it. And some astronauts need that because they have to have that sensation like their head is laying on a pillow. Um, the other thing that's kind of neat about sleeping in space is that the, the sun is constantly em emitting cosmic rays. It's constantly emitting particles from the sun. And par heavy particles like protons and neutrons are streaming through space all the time. When you close your eyes at night in space, sometimes, every once in a while, these particles will interact with your optic nerve. And when that happens, as you're sleeping, what you see are bright flashes of green, or you see bright flashes of light. For me, they were green and blue. And they all seem to go from left to right. And I think that's just the way that my brain was interpreting it. And it's so, it's some, and sometimes it's so bad that astronauts can't sleep. It's like watching fireworks while you're sleeping. Pretty hard to do. The other thing is that when you're sleeping in space, as you breathe in and out here on Earth, 
the hot air from your breath goes up and it's replaced by, by cooler air that has oxygen in it down below and then you, that's what you breathe in. In space, you don't have up, down, left, or right, so convection doesn't work. As you breathe out, the oxygen or the CO2 goes out and it comes right back in. And if you don't have air circulating around your head, eventually you build this CO2 bubble around your head and you start to have a headache. And if you, it got really, really bad, you could actually suffocate. But usually your headache would wake you up at night if you were in a place where you didn't have good air circulation. It's not a really big deal. All you have to do is just kind of do this and get some air circulating around your head. And now all of a sudden you've got fresh oxygen and you can go right back to sleep. That's one thing that's a little bit different. Going to the bathroom in space, another big deal. You know, we've got to do it here on Earth, right? Um, in the space shuttle, but very special equipment that was, that was made. Kind of like a vacuum cleaner. Yeah, you know, number one, boys and girls, guess what? Did it the exact same. But guess what? Boys and girls are different. So the attachment that they use for that, that, that vacuum cleaner, that, that suction tube, is a little bit different. One's designed for boys, one's designed for girls. And every crew member had their own special funnel. Number two, guess what? The anatomy is the exact same. So the, the facilities were the exact same for boys and girls. One space shuttle toilet, it's called the waste compartment system, the WCS, it had a hole about that big in it, okay? So what does that tell you? You gotta be a really good aim, because guess what? <laughs> if you make a mess, guess who's cleaning it up? Mom's not around, dad's not around, yep, you're gonna be cleaning that up. In fact, at NASA, they would train by, by going to a, a specific facility that actually had a camera looking up through the hole. Now obviously, you didn't train with that one. You used, just used that one for alignment. So things like sleeping in space, going potty in space, um, eating food in space, also really challenging because every time you open up your package of food, things start to float all over the place. Um, the bottom line is that it's, it's a very, very unique, very um, rich experience that goes beyond looking at the stars and looking at the Earth and even the technical aspects of, of the International Space Station. And so what I'll encourage uh, the students that are here is to... Keep in mind that, you know, when I started off pursuing my path, I didn't really know where I wanted to go or what I wanted to do. But what I did know is what I cared about. I cared about space, I loved engineering, and I knew that the two together would one day take me where I wanted to go. So I'll, I'll ask you, the students that are here, the, the younger, younger uh, children that are here, is that just to keep that in mind, and to the older parents, I'd ask you, Continue to encourage your, your children by taking them out to these types of, of facilities like the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum and all the other wonderful museums because you don't know what it is that's going to inspire them. You don't know what, where their passion is going to be. And by the more exposures that you give to them, the greater opportunity they're going to have to cross that, that one point in time where the, they're going to decide, this is what I want to do with the rest of my life. So I encourage you students, you know, continue exploring everything that you possibly can. Work hard, never get up. You don't have, don't, never give up. You don't have to be a straight A student. All you have to do is just remember those two things. Work hard, don't give up. Thank you guys for your time. Um, at, at this time, uh, so I also get another, a number of other questions um, about, you know, what's it like What's, what's life for an astronaut and an astronaut's family? And so I'd like to invite my, my wife, Marie, to come on up here. And uh, we're going to spend a few minutes here. My, my lovely wife and I, we've got five children, three of which have now just taken off and they're off looking at things here in the Space Museum. We have two that are in college right now. And so um, I'd like to spend some time, I guess, uh, offer it up to, to talk and chat a little bit about the astronaut and astronaut family life. So have a seat. Actually, we've never done this before. This is a wonderful opportunity uh, to talk to the wife of an astronaut. Um, I think the children didn't want to come on stage. They're, they're too cool for that. Uh, but to talk to a family member about what is it like to have an astronaut in the family? Is it, is it glamorous? Is it stressful? Or is it just normal life with occasionally long business trips? I think for the children, uh, it's normal life because they were born after he was already flying, so they don't know anything different. Um, for myself, and Danny and I knew each other uh, since we were in college, we grew up in the same neighborhood in El Paso, Texas. And I would have to say 
the stress probably comes from losing the privacy of, of having that family life and being able to raise your children normally. You feel like you're always on camera in a way or always being watched or always representing NASA? Always representing NASA. You know, and a lot of folks don't necessarily think about this, but when an astronaut decides that they want, or a person decides they want to become an astronaut, very rarely are there any that become astronauts that have decided to themselves, the reason I want to become an astronaut is because I want to become a famous explorer. That's never the case. Astronauts who come into the program are there because they're passionate about space, and they're passionate about what they do. They want to fly a rocket, they want to go and explore, uh, you know, explore space, they want to be part of the International Space Station, they want to work for NASA. We never think to ourselves that this has a, has a very public um, side to the, to the job. And, and consequently, for, for a number of us, myself included, the, the whole um, public aspect of being an astronaut does it catches, it'll catch you by surprise. And it's not just you, it's the whole family. It, it's the entire family, right. absolutely. That's really interesting. I hadn't thought about that aspect before. Does that affect the way then that you bring up your children? Do you, um, are there different lessons that you need to teach them or different uh, ways of dealing with the world than maybe a family that doesn't have this public role? I think more importantly, the children probably don't realize um, how fortunate they are to have a father as an astronaut. In the same respect, I'm glad that none of them want to be astronauts because their dad's a really hard act to follow. <laughs> so, but what we do try and encourage each and every one of them is to be passionate about something and to have a purpose um, in life and um, be resilient. And, and, and Marie's right, you know, right on target there. It goes back to what I said at, at the very end there. And, with hard work and determination, you can accomplish anything you want in life. And, and passion is not about, about space. And you know, talent is not about engineering, right? Those just happen to fall in line with what I, what I care about. What we try to instill in our children is that you know, through hard work and determination, they can accomplish anything. And they can reach any heights that they, that they want to. And we have to be there to support them and guide them and, and provide them with that level of, of um, uh, push. And even in, in areas where I don't necessarily, wouldn't say it's necessarily my strong suit because I'm a technical person, um, that doesn't mean that that's where they're going to end up. So I have to be prepared to step outside my comfort zone and encourage and push them into areas that, that I may not be familiar with. Still, you flew both your missions not long after the Columbia tragedy. And uh, I suspect that you and your children knew some of those astronauts. Uh, Columbia was the uh, space shuttle that broke up during re-entry in 2003. And, um, did that have an impact on you and your children at a much more tender age, maybe, than you would have anticipated that they would have to deal with tragedy well, and my, grief? Well, my youngest, uh, who is now 13, she was born two days after Columbia accident. Mm -hmm. And my oldest at the time was seven years old, and I don't think um, she really understood what was happening. Um, uh, you Danny, did, however. I, I did, you I did, did, and I had just, I was out to here, <laughs> and ultimately had my child two days later, and it was, it was a very stressful time, of course. I didn't know the crew, but Danny did know the crew. Uh, Elon Ramon was uh, one of my classmates, you know, and um, I think because I said earlier that the, you know, the astronaut uh, core is pretty tight, because we have all these shared experiences that any loss, uh, even if there are multi, you know, many classes beyond, uh, is considered a very uh, a loss to the core, and, and you, you definitely feel it. And obviously, with the with the devastating loss of Columbia, um, every every astronaut, every astronaut's family was affected in one way or the other. Well, and I think it reminded the whole nation and and really the whole world um, that spaceflight is not as easy as it looks. Um, that it's still a pioneering endeavor. Um, it's still a big experiment, really, uh, because when you're riding on a rocket, you're really riding on top of a huge bomb, a huge explosive. And no matter how careful you are, things can go wrong. Well, and I'd like to add just something to that. For just by audience in here, who would like to fly in space? Raise your hand. It'd be a cool, cool experience, right? Okay, so let me give you some, some facts and figures here. The, uh, the space shuttle 
was the, is the safest rocket uh, spacecraft ever built by mankind. Um, we lost 40% of all the vehicles that we built. We had five space shuttles, two of them failed. That gives you a, a failure rate of 40%. That means if you take a look at the number of launches that we had, 135, that means one in every 60, uh, 63 and a half failed, uh, ended up in, in, um, in loss of life. Um, we, if you count the number of belly buttons, depending on how you do the math, looking at payload specialists and, and uh, as astronauts or not astronauts, anywhere from one in 16 to one in 19 astronauts never made it home. They think about those odds, and for those of you who flew in on a commercial aircraft to, or this, during this, this event or this, this, um, this trip to DC, you know, ask yourself, is that, are those good odds for you if you were to go to the airport and say, I have a one in 20 shot of not making it, or one in 20 of these people that are on this plane won't make it to their destination. There's still a lot to be learned in space flight. We have a long way to go. Um, as, as NASA continues to evolve, uh, we have to kind of remember that space is a very hazardous place. Doesn't mean it can't be conquered. We've done a tremendous amount over a short period of time, but there's still a ways to go to really get to the point where we have really safe, reliable commercial space flight. And I think before we go to questions again, I, I'd like to ask if you, you would care to comment on what has it meant to be a participant in this endeavor? What has it meant to you, your family, even to the nation, uh, to be involved, to live in this time in this era where humans are living in space constantly and going back and forth. Well, it, as we walk through the, the museum here, one thing I, I'm uh, taken with is that from the Wright brothers to the space shuttle, all of that had to happen in order for us to be at this point in time. For me, as, as a, a person who was an had an opportunity to fly in space, you know, it, it's, it's a... Um, it, I'm, I'm very honored, and it's a privilege to have, have flown your vehicle into space because it was born in the, on the back of the U.S. taxpayers, um, and discovery is all of ours. And so I thank you for giving me the opportunity. It was a privilege from my perspective, and anything that, that I did and contributed will hopefully take, continue that story that we see here in the Smithsonian, even if it's small and even if it's insignificant, even that if my name should end up you know, going to the... To the, to the sidelines so that to be forgotten after this, after this talk, to me it doesn't matter because it's about continuing the story. And so, um, you know, I think um, I'm, I'm very privileged to, to have had that, that opportunity as I am to have had uh, the wonderful support of my family and, and, and had an opportunity to show this, this aspect of, of what makes America great uh, to our children. And Marie, do you have a perspective too? Well, I, I agree with everything Danny says. Um, I'm, I'm proud that my children are learning that um, from one small, and it, it takes you know, a nation to get to space, but just by one person making a difference and having a purpose, it just you know, grows from there. And I'm proud that my children are learning that lesson, and one thing that they do in life is going to affect, and everyone should feel like they should, they're going to affect their nation or make some effect in their life. Thank you. Uh, do we have online questions now? Uh, let's see, I see one that says, uh, how would you encourage kids to pursue science, uh, or pursue space flight as a career? Um, you know, I think, uh, I think of the, the, one of the most important things that uh, students can do is really try and find where their talents lie. Uh, because space flight in general, is made up a number of technical disciplines. It's not just engineers, it's not just scientists. If you look at NASA, it's everything from lawyers and business people, to business professionals, to administrators, to technical people. There's all different ways that we can play within the, the space program. And so space flight in general, that's what I was interested in. I was fortunate enough to become an astronaut, but it's certainly, if I had never become an astronaut because I was involved in the space exploration program, I was very happy with that. So I would encourage them to really come look, look deeply within themselves to find out what those talents and skills are, hone those, and continue that, that passion and then try to feed into that, the, the whole idea of what can I do to benefit space. You can be, even be a historian or a be writer. A exactly. <laughs> uh, or an artist or a photographer and be involved in the space program. Or a museum uh, curator. So there's probably not a field that doesn't have a career in space. 
Uh, okay, let's take a question here. Is this boot camp going to space, and were you a test pilot? I was not a test pilot. I was actually what's referred to as a, as a um, um, civilian scientist. So I didn't grow up, uh, I wasn't a top gun, didn't fly jets. Uh, eventually I had to learn how to fly jets, learned how to fly T-38 as well as a bunch of other aircraft. That's part of the requirements because flying in space is a, it's a flying job. Uh, these boots never made it to space, but these are one of a kind. And these are the only ones that were ever made. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm really, I'm sad to see them go, but I'm happy that they're going to be here with Discovery because I had a really great time when I was on Discovery. Okay, let's take another online question. Um, do you have a favorite memory from your time in space? Something interesting or scary or funny? Oh boy. Um, probably the most interesting time for me in space was uh, the end of the very first space shuttle mission that I took, which was uh, in 2007. I was on the flight deck of the space shuttle looking out the windows and looking into some neighboring galaxies that uh, are, are neighbors to the Milky Way. They're called the Magellanic Clouds, which if you're from the Southern Hemisphere, you're familiar with them. If you're, um, if you're into astronomy, you're probably familiar with them as well. But for me, growing up in North America, I was never familiar with them. So to me, they were a surprise. And what I was fascinated by was here, here I was, you know, this one little astronaut floating around this little bitty rock that's, you know, a third out from the sun and on this middle-sized galaxy called the Milky Way. And I'm looking at our next door neighbor, galaxy and just being blown away by the fact that we think we've done a lot and certainly if you look in the air in the museum we've done a tremendous amount but there's so much left to do there's so much left to explore there's I mean it's that's what's exciting about space it's all about answering questions and, and finding more and having more questions to ask and as far as we know it's infinite that exactly <laughs> yes question Well, I was fortunate in that on STS-128, by that time they had the uh, IP phone, so basically the internet protocol phone. You got VoIP phones at home, so very similar. And then also by email, that was the other way. Now they actually uh, communicate by Twitter and by all sorts of other different social media. However, it's a, little, it's a little bit different because it's not real time. What they do is they basically load up all the packets and then when you have the right kind of communication coverage with the satellites and the ground stations, they download all that data. That data gets processed then by the ground. They figure out where it needs to go, and then they send it off and on its way. But phones, I was actually, I was calling Marie directly from the space station saying, hey, how's it going? <laughs> could she dial up and get you? She could not dial oh. up. <laughs> Our area code kept on changing. <laughs> okay, let's do another online. Um, how long did it take you to adjust to being back on Earth after space flight? Oh, so after space flight on my first mission, it actually took me a while. I would say it was about six days. Uh, when I first got off the space shuttle, it really felt like I was on a boat and everything was continuing to move. But the brain is a wonderful, the wonderful engineering marvel um, in that it took that experience and it learned from it and then when I came back on STS-128, within two hours, my brain knew exactly what was going on and it made the proper corrections. And so I felt fine. So it was, it was really nice. So for six days on the, on the first mission, two hours on the second mission. Wow. The body is very adaptable. Question? Did someone inspire me to be an astronaut? Well, I mean, she's sitting right here next to me. If it wasn't because of my wife, she would, I never would have gotten there. I mean, so many times where I was just, just totally ready to give up and because she continued to encourage me and, and, and push me. Just like in, in the um, uh, uh, Orville and Wilbur Wright uh, um, exhibit, the sister, her name is Kathleen? Mm -hmm. uh, Kathleen? Um, Catherine. Catherine? Uh, she encouraged her brothers to continue to pursue after they continued to fail. So, you know, um, I'd have to say uh, 
because her inspiration source is right next to me. What's that? Did I land on it? I did. I landed on the best planet in the solar system. You want to guess which one that is? Earth. Planet Earth. That's where everyone that I love, everyone I care about is right here. That's why I would never want to land on another planet because I think that probably would be, at least right now, a one-way trip. Um, that's a great question. I would say um, move slowly. Um, in, in space, if you move too fast, the laws of Newton are there, and they're there all the time. So if you get going really fast, eventually you're going to have to stop yourself. I mean, you get this thing called momentum. It goes, it, it gets really, it goes up really, really fast the faster you move. And so if, you're, if you are going too fast, through the space station, and you go to try and stop yourself, you can actually hurt your arms and hurt your muscles. Um, there's some things you can't really prepare for. Once you get into space and you don't have gravity acting on your body the same way, things like your muscles start to atrophy. It's just like if you're, if you have in, you're in bed rest, right? For the entire time you're in the space, in the, on the, in the space mission, the, uh, the density of your bones become less. You've got decalcification of your bones because you don't have gravity acting to make those bones strong. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of things that, 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 are, that are like that, but um, yeah. Um, I'd like to mention that just before the program started, uh, Danny presented a book to each teacher, uh, the one from Oyster Adams Bilingual School and uh, the one from Whittier Academic Campus. And it's a book he wrote about a hypothetical space mission on Endeavor, right? Would you like to talk just a minute about what it was like to write a book about space flight? And that book will go back to your classrooms. Okay, I guess we don't have time, we don't for, have that. time for that. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I should say that uh, we have that book handy with us today, Endeavor's Long Journey. Danny's gonna sign books outside the gallery. Once again, we would like to thank the Boeing Company for sponsoring this program. Uh, we would like to thank the whole Olivas family for being here today. It's a wonderful program, and thank you again for these very special boots. Yes, and I would like to reciprocate by uh, offering you a book that the museum has published. It's The Life History of Discovery. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.